Hello and welcome to Lincoln Road Chapel online service. I'm glad that you can join us. Uh, we are back into lockdown, however, that does not stop us from praising the Lord. Uh, this morning I've been reading Psalm 71 and I'll share with you a couple of verses that, I, uh, that blessed my heart. Psalm 71 says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thy ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, where, I, where unto I may continually restore. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. And verse 5 says, For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. Uh, verse 7 says, I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Uh, I think the psalmist here, uh, David, I believe, uh, wrote, uh, was praying this prayer in his old age, hence the reference here where he says, I, thou art my trust from my youth. Uh, uh, but one thing is very clear here, that the David trusted in the Lord. Uh, uh, despite his accomplishment, you know, despite what the Lord was able to do through his life, he recognized one thing, that it was the Lord's doing. And um, this is why in verse 7, I like uh, uh, verse 7 where he says, I am as a wonder unto many. You know, I am who I am today. I have achieved whatever I've managed to achieve in life. It's not my doing. He says, but thou art my strong refuge. And the Lord has been his strong tower. The Lord has always been there. And because he had trusted in the Lord. And then verse 8, yeah, which I, I which I bless my heart, it says, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise, with thy honor all the day. In every circumstance, in whatever I've managed to do, let my mouth be filled with praise and honor all the day. I want to be to praise you and to proclaim your glory all the day. Isn't that wonderful? Even as, let us praise the Lord. Let our mouths be filled with God's praise, glory and honor for what the Lord has been able to do, for what the Lord continues to do in our lives. Uh, there's one song that really blesses my heart. Uh, 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 I think the song is, is by Keith Gett and uh, uh, Stuart Town, Townend. That my heart is filled with thankfulness. They're beautifully written song. It says, my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pen, who plants the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart. And the, 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 the following verse, you know, it says, To him who walks beside with floods of, of my weaknesses and floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fear to fly, whose every promise is enough for every step I take, sustaining me with arms of love, arms of love and crowning me with grace. Isn't that wonderful? Our prayer this morning would, should be to thank the Lord. Our prayer this morning, like David was able to say, should be, let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day long because of what the Lord has done and what the Lord continues to do. Because we cannot count, we cannot, we, there's so much that the Lord has done for us. All we can say is, Thank you, Lord. As we begin our service, shall we just uh, pray together? Our God and our Father in heaven, we want to give you all the glory and honor. 
we thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made, and we shall be glad and rejoice in it, regardless of the situation we are in. I know we are not meeting with many folks because of this corona pandemic, but Lord God Almighty, we shall continually praise you. Let our mouths, O oh God, filled with your praise, glory and honor. Father, we pray for for this service. We pray for your word as it comes forth. We pray that, Lord, it shall come forth with power. We pray that, Lord, lives shall be changed. Father, you shall encourage us in your word, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we give you all the glory and honor. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. must be that part of the service. You know the one, the children's spot. Yes, well that wasn't very funny was it? Now I've been thinking about certain objects. What's your favourite object? Around the world there are some pretty special ones. What about this one? The Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, or what about this one? Really, you have to go to America, Canada for this one. Niagara Falls, what an object that is. What a special, spectacular scene that would be. And then again, you might have been to London to look at these objects, the crown jewels that are found in the Tower of London. But for me, you know, there's nothing more special than the object that I have in my heart. What I'm thinking about is 
a cardboard box. Now, what could be more interesting than a cardboard box? Well, maybe one thing, maybe an empty cardboard box might be your thing. The cardboard boxes, joking aside, are really useful. You could, for example, put your toys in a cardboard box, keep them nice and tidy. You could put books in a cardboard box. You could even use a cardboard box when um, you're going to move house. Uh, yeah. But uh, of course, there are some certain sizes to cardboard boxes. You couldn't, for example, put a vacuum cleaner inside this cardboard box. But you know, there's some things, some people have cardboard boxes for God. They think you can fit God into a cardboard box. And they've got to remember that God is much bigger than a cardboard box. He's bigger than you. He's bigger than me, he's bigger than the world, he's bigger than the sun, he's bigger than the universe. He's far too big. Um, and there's just nothing that he cannot do. There's no power that he's short of. And we're going to hear a story about that right now. What I'm about to tell you is a true story. It really did happen many years ago when Jesus was alive on earth. At the end of a very busy day, Jesus and his disciples decided to go across the Sea of Galilee. So they got into a boat and they sailed, and it was their intention to sail from one side to the other of the Sea of Galilee. Here is a map to show the direction they took. They started off from a city called Capernaum and they were beginning to cross the Lake of Galilee. They got about halfway across. And at this point, the sea was calm and Jesus was tired. He'd had a very hard day's work. So he went to the back of the boat. He found a pillow and put his head on it and went fast asleep. Now, the one thing that you need to know about the Sea of Galilee is that it's surrounded by hills and sometimes winds would rush down those hills and across the Sea of Galilee and whip up the waves into a storm. But on this occasion, it whipped up a ferocious storm, a storm that the disciples had never seen the like of, or they'd certainly never been out on the sea in such conditions. In fact, it got so bad that there was more water getting into the boat than was getting out. And then they did a very sensible thing. They went to the back of the boat and they shook Jesus and they said to him, Master, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus opened his eyes and he said to his disciples, Oh, you of little faith. And with that, he stood up, he stretched his arms out and he cried out to the weather, Peace, be still. And astonishingly, the wind died down and the sea stopped bouncing around instantly. And all was calmness. It was as calm as a smooth pond. But then a different kind of fear came across the disciples. Not about the weather this time, but about the one who was in the boat with them. They said to one another, what kind of man is this that even the wind, even the waves obey him? So there are two things that we can know about this story. Firstly, we can know that God has no limits. There's no cardboard box big enough for God. You can't confine him. His power is limitless. And secondly, you can trust him with anything. There's nothing too big, there's nothing too small that God cannot concern himself with. So if you've got something really big on your heart, or really small, you can take it to God in prayer. Don't delay. Do it today. You could, for example, ask Jesus to come into your heart and life and be your very special friend. Or you could ask him to help you be a better person. Or you might have a friend 
um, who doesn't even believe that God actually exists. And you can ask God to persuade him or her that he really is there and he can be their special friend as well. So let's remember from the cardboard box and from this story that God is mighty. And as the old song goes, goes my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing that he cannot do. Thank you for listening. Today's Bible reading is found in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 34. John chapter 1, verses 19 to 34. John the Baptist denies being the Messiah. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? 
He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. John testifies about Jesus. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The Lord bless the reading of his words into our hearts today. Well, hello and welcome to our 34th, I think it is, recorded meeting for Sunday, the 1st of November 2020. The title for the talk today is Just As I Am, I Come. The reason for this is because of the Daily Hope uh, phone line that we've advertised in our latest newsletter, Chapel Newsletter, dated the 23rd of, or it, at least it was the latest newsletter. Uh, by the time this is broadcast, I guess it will not be, but newsletter number 31, the 23rd of October. And I listened to uh, Just As I Am, by Charlotte Elliott. It's number 354 in our Redemption Hymnal. Um, and I found this the story of her conversion and the way in which she, she, she led, she was led to write this hymn in connection with that. Very interesting and inspiring. I hope you will too, if you would like to listen to that. It's possibly the only hymn I have actually ever preached on Somebody might object, you're not meant to preach on hymns, you preach on the word, preach the word, the Apostle Paul said. Yes, but an address, when you preach the Bible, share the gospel message, you arrange it in a certain, hopefully logical, helpful way for people to understand and be able to respond to. And sometimes a hymn is set out like a sermon that you sing. And this hymn is something like that. Um, if not exactly like that. Um, but I'm not preaching the hymn this time, but I will refer to it. Indeed, the title, Just As I Am, then a little few, a, a gap, then I come, is the first four and then the last two lines of the words of each verse of the hymn. And I, I'm going to pray now. Would you just kindly pray with me that we would hear from the Lord himself. Now, through this book, this Bible message. Thank you. This is your word, our God and Father, and in it, it speaks of the one you sent, our Lord Jesus, who is present here through the Holy Spirit, with all who are looking for you, when your people gather in a special way, but also looking for people who don't know you. Lord, make that your presence known and do something 
would you actually save people through this talk and through lots of other people bringing your truth over online and in lots of different ways. We ask that you would kindly do that because it is your will. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Just as I am, I come. Firstly, who I come to. Secondly, nothing can stop me coming to him. And thirdly, I do come. Who I come to. I'm going to read you a few verses from John chapter 1. This was read to us earlier in the service. John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. <clears throat> this is before Jesus had even started his ministry. The next day, his public ministry, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, look at the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I didn't know him, but that he should be made manifest, obvious to Israel. That's why I'm come baptizing with water. And John bare record. He gave his testimony, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it rested upon him. And I didn't know him. But he that sent me to baptize with water, God of course, the same said to me, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending, the same is he which baptizes, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And I saw, and I bear record, I shared, I gave my testimony to the fact that this is the Son of God. So who is he? He is the sacrifice for sin. John said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, all the Jews would have understood that the Lamb was one of those animals that could be sacrificed in the place, that would die in the place of the person approaching God to take his sin. I spoke about this in an address not so long ago. And Jesus is the fulfilment of that. And in fact, he made it, if you read the book letter to the Hebrews especially, it makes it clear that those sacrifices of animals are now entirely unnecessary because they couldn't actually take away sin. They just simply pointed to the Lord Jesus, who is the actual sin bearer, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, not just of Jews, but all people. Um, that's who he is. He was, according to the passage we've just read, one who was before John, and yet John was about six months older than him. It hints at his divinity because he was God who became a man. He was before John. This one is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And when John saw in the form of a dove peace coming upon Jesus when Jesus was baptized, he said that, that this is the Son of God. He's the one who can baptise other people, not just in water as I'm doing, but in God, the Holy Spirit. This is a remarkable person. And of course, the, 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 the baptism that John took, when he baptised Jesus, Jesus was in effect doing in symbol what he was going to do. In fact, later, he was dying for people's sin, because John was saying, uh, he, he came with the baptism of repentance uh, for the remission, the forgiveness of sins, but Jesus had no sins to forgive. So when he was baptised, he, as it were, stood in the sinner's place, it, a kind of a, a foreshadowing of what he would actually do, actually do, maybe three and a half years later, on the cross, taking the sin of the world. He's the Lamb of God that takes the sin. Of the world. That was the moment. Heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit came down. God said, you're my beloved son. All my purposes are fulfilled in you. And there's a little clue 
as to how we recognize this. Remember John was saying, behold the Lamb of God. Look, this is the one I've come to tell you about. That's the purpose of me. The, he was the most important prophet up to that time, the most powerful prophet up to that time. He, he, he was to get people ready for him. And when he saw him, he said, look, he's the Lamb of God. But the moment he said it was, as Jesus came to him, and it is as Jesus comes to us that we recognize him. He comes to us as the one who takes our sin, who can put us right with God. And the fact that he's coming means he's alive. I mean, obviously he was alive then, but he's alive now as he comes to us. Having died, there's a lovely picture in a book of symbols, the last book of the Bible in uh, the book of the Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 6. I'm just going to read you that one verse, which beautifully conveys this. Remember, it's a book of symbols. It's not obviously not literal. John says, and behold, uh, and lo, behold, lo, <laughs> look, look, in the middle of the throne, this is the throne of God, the one who rules the universe. And of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. He's now alive, but he has died. Jesus, who's died and risen from the dead. Having seven horns. It's a picture. Horn is power. Seven, a number of perfection. He has all power to save, of course, to be the lamb. And seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit, seven eyes, the seven spirits of God sent to look. The Lord Jesus coming, looking for people, seeking them, saving them. And when he comes to them, ah, he's the Lamb of God. He's the one who can save us and he has all power to do it. And when I come to him, he's down here with me, but I'm actually coming to God in the throne. It's a beautiful picture in Revelation 5 and verse 6. Who do I come to? I come to the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Then secondly, nothing can stop me coming because Jesus is the fulfillment of the purpose of God. Not only is he God, one of the members of the Godhead, the Trinity as we say, as the, uh, the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but as it puts it in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, the Father sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. That's, that's why he came. Or as Paul puts it, summing up the mission of Jesus in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save, rescue, deliver sinners from their sin, to put them right, to make them better people, to make them right with God. And Jesus himself said, I came not to call sinners, I'm uh, sorry, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, to, to turn from it. You can turn from it, you can come to me, I've come for that purpose. In other words, the very thing that stops me coming to God my sin, Christ, the Lamb of God, deals with, gets rid of when I come. So that the barrier between God and I, that which alienates me from him, is removed. My sin, my rebellion, I have a nature that tends to shake its fist at God. And if not outwardly like that, it's hypocritical and it hides it, but it just doesn't want to know. It, it's, it, it, and, and my practice reflects that in a big outward garish way, or maybe a more shy, small way, but it's there. It doesn't, I, I, and I am entirely different in character and in motivation to God. Despite being made in his image, I've fallen, I'm, I'm the sin is in me, it's part of me. He is holy, apart from all that's wrong, absolutely good and pure and wonderful. And I am sinful, dirty, lost, different. His motivation is one of love and justice, always. Me, 
selfish, egotistical, proud of my petty, stupid achievements, which I can only do if they are of any value at all, and they're always spoiled, but I can only do them because God has enabled me. It's just ridiculous. Naturally, we can never come together, be one, be friends, be in any kind of relationship, but Christ, the sin bearer, the one who takes all that stupid, horrible, mucky, limited, selfish sin on himself. He became sin. He, now alive, having come back from that death, physical death and spiritual death, because when all that muck from me and the whole world was put upon him, God looked away. There was a severance between God the Son and God the Father. And because of that, that's the one, that Lamb, that Lord Jesus calls me to come to him. I can't come direct to God because of his, our utter difference from each other, but I can come through the Lord Jesus. And if I can just refer to the hymn, I said I wasn't going to preach it, I'm not, but I'm going to just refer to the first three verses. Christ's invitation. The first verse, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, come to me. All of you who labour, heavy laden, with guilt, with frustration, with all the burden of life. I will give you rest. I'll change it. Uh, and, and, I, and as the hymn puts it, I come without one plea, without one reason why he must or should. I deserve absolutely nothing. There's no sense of merit. If I appeal to him, I appeal to his mercy, his love, his goodness, his grace. Not anything I deserve. I deserve absolutely the opposite of the life and help he offers. He, he bids me come. Verse 2, uh, I'm not going to wait to try and put myself right before I come to him. Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. O Lamb of God, I come, I come to you, make me better, wash me, clean me, my heart, my sin, get rid of it, wash it away. In other words, I come to the one who can deal with my sin, the thing that cuts me off from God, both its guilt, the fact that I did it, and, and he's taken the guilt, the, the very action, and also the power of sin. He breaks it. He takes it. I come to him for him to do that. I'm not going to wait until I improve myself because I'll wait forever. And I mean forever. One more verse, verse three. Despite the fact that I have doubts, worries, concerns, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, I'm just thrown all over the place. Fightings, and fears within, without, outside. Things outside me, things inside me, trouble me. Well, with all that situation, O Lamb of God, I come. I might worry about my ability to be different, to be able to be a Christian, to live a Christian life. You're right to doubt it, because you can't. Neither can I, none of us can. We're kept by the power of God. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. He looks after me. He saves me. I may worry that my motives for coming are not perfect. Believe me, they're not. God makes, sort of gives me a motivation to want to come to him. And that's right. But this is an element of me. Am I completely sincere? Is there no ulterior motive? Of course there is. I have to come to him and allow him to deal with that. Similar kind of thing. 
Am I coming simply because I look at those Christians and I envy them, their kind of confidence in God, not arrogance in themselves, but confidence in God, their peace, the fact that they know what they're doing, they, they've got a purpose in life. Is that just a selfish thing in coming? Or maybe I'm just simply frightened of hell and I'm coming for that reason. Is that a good reason? Well, there are reasons the Bible actually gives warnings they give and incentives they give to come. God uses those things and any selfishness within them, he will have to sort out and he will. I can come because he invites me, not waiting to be better with all my doubts. I might even think, is he really God? Who's become a man? My saviour? Can he really do that? Just be honest before God. Come with your doubts and he will deal with them. Show himself who he really is. I, I, I remember I used to think genuinely, maybe I was, I came to Christ when I was 19 and a half. Maybe I'm just 19 now, maybe a little bit early, I'm not sure. Looking at Christians and I was thinking, I'll never be saved. I'll never be like them. I remember seeing our then youth leader, Roger, who opened our meeting today. Um, and thinking, I'll never be like him. That, that kind of confidence he could speak to the young people, knowing where he stood and helping them so kindly. I could never do that. And I'll certainly never have the courage to witness to my friends, to be able to tell them about the Lord Jesus and what he's done for me. I knew I couldn't do that. I would just die with embarrassment. But I did because he saves and I've made lots of mistakes on the way and he forgives and lifts me up and keeps me going and that's what he does for everybody it's what he'll do for you nothing can stop me nothing in me or outside of me not the devil himself and the worst enemy than the devil me no 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 I can and finally, I do come. Now, I, I think this element in a, in, a, in a Christian message, in the gospel, the good news message, is so often missing from what the church is preaching today. I'm talking generally, not everywhere. Maybe I'm thinking particularly in our country, in the UK. Um, I noticed the title of a book being advertised recently. I haven't read it, but it's called Where Has All the Gospel Preaching Gone? by Roger Carswell. I think it's a short book, I would imagine. It's very appropriate. Where's it gone? Uh, I, I, some of the newer songs that we sing are very lovely. I say newer, you know, there's the old hymns, there's the newer songs, and anyway, there's some. But often, some of them are very good and have gospel facts. The truth is often, not always, but often very good. Some of the old hymns are rubbish. It's just, are they true to the Bible or not? But often these newer songs lack, or they seem to me, the ones I've seen, and maybe I'm wrong and there are others, and I hope so, but they seem to lack the actual application of the message. Here it is, here is the truth, but you must now come, or the words of the, the hymn we're looking at, who put the words of someone coming to Christ on their lips as they sing it. O Lamb of God, I come. The church seems to be big on welcoming people and how important that is, of course. That's vital. But you are welcome among us can become blurred with you are one of us. You've had the experience that we've had. And if you get too many people in like that and they don't have a Christian experience, you cease to be a church. You're more like a club or an organisation. People should feel comfortable with us in the way we welcome them. Come and sit with me or we can't do that at the moment because of this Covid business. But you know what I mean. But they shouldn't feel comfortable with how they are before God. Not until they've actually come to Christ. They don't come in order to realise that Jesus is their saviour, that God is their father. They 
come in order to come to Jesus so that God may be their father and Jesus is their saviour. In the words of another hymn, O come to the father through Jesus the son. That is the important thing. Here's a brief list of some of the way the Christian experience is described and Notice that with each one of them, there is a before situation and then there's an after. And it's the after situation that means you are a Christian, not the before. For instance, conversion means turning. I need to be turned. It's more than repentance. That's kind of me turning by grace. This is God turning me, changing me. Well, before I turn, I wasn't turned. Forgiveness. Um, I, I owe God every single thing I've done wrong and things I should have done that I've not and things I thought that are wrong and so on. It, it, it's like a mountain of debt. I owe God. But he God graciously forgives me on the basis of what Christ has done. But there's a moment when I wasn't forgiven. Then there's a moment when all my sins are gone forever. Like the, the, the distance of one point of the compass to another, they're just removed forever. That, that doesn't happen gradually. I'm not forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm free. Cleansing is another word. Washing the sin away. One moment I'm dirty. I confess my sins and I'm cleansed, washed. They're gone. They're all gone. In, there's another phrase. Justification, it's the, so essential, so important in understanding the Christian faith. God declares that the sinner is righteous, not because he's made a mistake, but because Christ, the righteous one, has taken the sin, the guilt, and all of it. It's gone, even the, the, the fact that I did it somehow is gone, it's placed upon him. And God can look at me and say, not innocent. I was guilty, but the guilt has gone. Righteous. Justified. But there was a moment before I trusted the Christ who died in my place and is now alive and representing me. Before that moment, I was not justified by faith. Then I put my faith in him. I trusted him and I was justified by faith. Redemption is another picture that the Bible speaks of a person outside of Christ being a slave to sin, like in a slave market, that I cannot break free. There may be times when I would like to be different, but I can't. Sometimes I didn't care less. And then a redeemer comes, one with the ransom price for my sin, the blood of Christ. He's died for me. He's now alive. He pays the price and I'm free, free to serve and glorify and live a useful life and have peace free from sin. Well, there was a moment when I wasn't redeemed. Now I am. The new birth. I enter the family of God, the kingdom of God, through the new birth, being born again. One moment I wasn't born, the next moment I was. And when I was, God was my father. The Lord Jesus Christ is my brother. Salvation used in one particular sense. He saved us. That's what Paul says in Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us. Like a person drowning in water, being pulled out. Or like a person in a, in a house that's full of fire and smoke and the a fireman comes up the ladder, drags you out and saves you. There was a moment when I was not saved. I was going to die, drowning, burning, smoke. And then the saviour came and took me out of it. I was unsaved, then I was saved. In other words, there's a moment when I say, O Lamb of God, I come. Lord Jesus, I come to you. You have called me. I, I'm doing it consciously. I know what I'm doing. It's a deliberate act. And it's in answer to your invitation. How dare I approach you? Otherwise, you bid me. Come. And I can do that just as I am, just now. Now, is that the moment for you? 
Is it that moment now? In other words, will you respond to the Lord Jesus as he calls you? You may. And you should. And you can do it just as you are. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. We thank you, Lord, for everyone listening, watching this service who can say that and know it's true. We pray for any who still have not said it, still have not experienced that. Would you bless them, draw them? And for any who have said it now, for the first time, have actually come to you, just grant in their hearts the absolute certainty that you've begun something that you will never, never stop. You will perfect, you will finish what you've started. You will make them like yourself and you'll keep them. Thank you, Lord, for this faith. The blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son, that is the Lamb of God, and the Holy Spirit rest with all of us who have come to Jesus. Amen.